The following program presents theories about an historical event that is shrouded in mystery. It contains archival footage, reenactments, and dramatizations, which invite you, the viewer, to draw your own conclusions. April 1945. As Allied forces liberate Nazi concentration camps, the world gets its first glimpse of the horrors wrought by Adolf Hitler's regime. At Nuremberg, the Allies prosecute leading Nazi officials for these crimes against humanity. Some of the most dangerous war criminals are brought to justice, but not all. There's a myth about Nazis, and that is, is that there's these horrible people that committed these terrible crimes, and then after 1945 simply disappeared. Well, that simply isn't true. The truth is that thousands of former Nazis, some of whom committed atrocities, went to work for the United States government without the public's knowledge. During the war, their crimes ranged from overseeing slave labor camps to sending orphans to their deaths. After the war, they were on the U.S. payroll, either as scientists in America or as intelligence agents in Europe. The U.S. government was willing to use mass murderers, was willing to protect them from justice, was willing to hide their, their activities from the American people. Government documents, declassified in the late 1990s, indicate that many of the former Nazis spying for the U.S. and Europe misrepresented and fabricated intelligence. Some even worked as double agents for the Soviet Union. But some say this secret U.S. strategy, even with its flaws, was the only way to win the Cold War. It is a duplicitous double game. You have to do that sometimes to advance a, a, a higher cause. It was U.S. policy to hire whomever could provide useful information, regardless of whether they were a war criminal or not. How far did the U.S. government go to cover up the wartime records of these recruits? And nearly 60 years later, does the American public know the whole truth? They can claim that they turned over everything, but we have to trust the government to believe that. It was a scandal. It was one of the great scandals of modern American intelligence history. Spring 1945. The Allies are on the verge of crushing the Nazi war machine. For many of Hitler's elite officers, self-preservation has become their top priority. It was only in the last couple of months of the war that members of the SS started to approach Americans with offers of assistance. And it was clear they were doing it because the writing was on the wall, the war was over. Among those carefully considering their predicament, 43-year-old General Reinhard Galen. Reinhard Galen was a general staff officer. He was, by the end of the war, a major general in the uh, German army. He was directly responsible for the German army's analytical group that studied the Soviet army. General Galen knows better than most that the end is near. With the Eastern Front collapsing, he has been giving the Fuhrer consistently grim news for months. As he foresaw the end, uh, he began telling Hitler the truth about what the situation was in the East, and Hitler didn't want to hear it. On April 9, 1945, Galen is dismissed from his post by Hitler. Later that month, he quietly assembles his closest advisors to execute his post-war strategy. He said, what we're going to do is we're going to get our files. We're going to get all of our most valuable files on the Soviet Union. We're going to make copies of them, and we're going to bury them in different places. And he did this in order to have a bargaining chip that he could use with the Western allies later. 
He accurately understood that an ideological showdown between East and West was, was evolving. And uh, he positioned himself in such a way as to take advantage of that. With his Nazi intelligence files safely hidden in the Bavarian mountainside, Galen turns himself in to American authorities on May 22, 1945, two weeks after his country's surrender. He grandly announces to his captors that he can provide unique intelligence on the Soviets to the American government. But it isn't until he is interrogated by a young army captain that officials realize the significance of their captive. A self-starter named Captain John Boker identifies Reinhard Galen in an interrogation center. He understood that the interests of the United States and the Soviet Union were not the same, and he felt that the time was absolutely right to use and to absorb whatever the Germans knew about the Soviets. For months, Boker has interrogated captured German officers. From them, he has learned what many in the upper echelons of the U.S. government already know. Despite his past promises, Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin's desire to spread communism throughout Europe is insatiable. So when General Galen emphasizes a gathering Soviet threat to the West, Captain Boker readily agrees. Galen was a master at playing on our fears about the Soviet Union. Yes, he told Boker exactly what Boker expected to hear, which is that the Soviets were a great menace, that their desire for land was inexhaustible, and that he, Galen, was an expert on this new threat. Within months of his surrender, the information Galen buried in the Alps is retrieved. While American intelligence analysts pore over his files, officials at the Pentagon decide to bring Galen and his officers to the United States. August 14, 1945. The Japanese surrender unconditionally. World War II is over. Ten days later, Galen and members of his staff are smuggled into the U.S. disguised as American civilians. This would have been a political disaster if it had been known, because the, the general feeling would have been, indeed, that we'd taken on a bunch of Nazis. And this was a time when we just wanted to string them up. And here we were on the side working with this German general. Galen insists he never joined the Nazi party but he is well aware that his role as a general in the Third Reich may subject him to indictment at Nuremberg. So upon his arrival at Fort Hunt, Virginia, General Galen sets about reinventing himself for his new American colleagues. When he was at Fort Hunt, he was creating this legend about himself as he really was, he was not really a Nazi, he was just someone who was a pure spy technician who at this stage of the game is an ardent anti-communist who happened to be a very skillful espionage expert who just wanted to work for the cause. According to author Christopher Simpson, however, Galen did more than gather intelligence. The former general is responsible for the brutal treatment of Soviets in Nazi POW camps. You had interrogators under Galen's authority interrogating the people in the camps and also offering them a choice of life or death. In other words, if you cooperate with and give us the intelligence you need, we'll give you some food. And if you don't cooperate, we won't and you'll die. Even as U.S. officials consider what to do with Hitler's henchmen, Galen quickly learns that increasing Soviet aggressions in Eastern Europe have already enhanced his value. The thinking about Galen shifts in this period. The Cold War makes it shift. Stalin makes a number of very threatening moves um, in 1945 and 46 that shakes up the debate about the future of U.S.-Soviet relations. We suddenly realized these guys are not trustworthy at all, and that frightened us badly. In the end, Washington's decision in 1945 to work with Galen is made out of an urgent need for spies 
who could provide solid intelligence about the Soviet Union. Most of the experts from that time, I've interviewed a number of them, agree that the files were essentially empty concerning Eastern European and, and Soviet affairs. As a result, the U.S. abruptly shifts from hunting key Nazis to courting them. On the one hand, you had units of the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps doing their job, tracking down Nazi war criminals. On the other hand, you had other units of the same organization recruiting them to work against the Soviet Union. When I arrived in Austria, my NCO, when I reported to him for duty on the wall, was a chart, uh, automatic arrest categories of the Nazi party and its affiliates. If you ran into these people, you were supposed to arrest them. And I said to him, I said, Izzy, what about this? He said, forget about it. We're after the communists now. In the summer of 1946, Reinhard Galen returns to Germany. Hitler's former general is now working for the United States. His orders? Recruit agents who can gather fresh information on the Soviets. Almost all of the operatives Galen recruits are former Nazis. Some are known war criminals. And all are now on the U.S. payroll. What Galen wanted to do was get as big as fast as he could because he knew that his survival depended on it. Galen is now the primary U.S. source of intelligence about the Soviet Union based in Germany. Can a former Nazi general be trusted? It's a question that will haunt U.S. intelligence for years to come. In the meantime, U.S. officials will begin another secret alliance with former Nazis. The original idea was to utilize German science. And out of that came uh, the Project Paperclip. September 1946. It's been little more than a year since former Nazi General Reinhard Galen began working secretly for the United States. By now, former Nazi scientists and engineers have also been brought to the U.S. and put on the government payroll. It's a top-secret operation run by the Joint Chiefs of Staff under the code name Paperclip. The project is named for the paperclips used in the files of the new German recruits. The project's purpose was to bring German scientists to the United States and use their skills. They would work for the U.S. military. Under President Harry Truman's guidelines, war criminals are supposed to be excluded from the program. But to the Joint Chiefs, this restriction impedes their mission of recruiting former Nazi scientists quickly, before the Soviets can grab them. The background checks were coming in that, lo and behold, some of them violated President Truman's policies. If you're dealing with hundreds of these scientists, you're not going to have those full field investigations. People come through with paperwork. Paperwork looks kind of good looks kind of bad, but, you know, there's no written order that they found. Bring the guy in. And so they simply doctored the files and sent whitewashed dossiers to the State Department. One of these files is that of Arthur Rudolph. He will later become famous as the project director of the Saturn V rocket program, which will one day help put a man on the moon. During World War II, Arthur Rudolph was the operations director of the Middleburg factory in this uh, cave underneath Konstein Mountain. He was responsible for overseeing the production of the V-2 missile. And to do that, he had the idea of using concentration camp inmates. Rudolf regularly exploited the labor of hundreds of prisoners from the Dora concentration camp who were put to work on his project. There was inadequate ventilation. In the winter, they froze. Uh, the dust from blasting uh, permeated the atmosphere. Prisoners at the Middleburg perished in, in large numbers, both because of the inhumane conditions down there uh, and uh, as a result of physical abuse by uh, civilian personnel and by the SS guards. 
All this happened on Rudolph's watch. He controlled the food. He controlled the conditions in the factory for these poor people and was responsible for that. Experts estimate that 20,000 men died in the tunnels at Mittelwerk. Despite his war crimes, Rudolf is recruited by the U.S. military. The official evaluation was that he was 100% Nazi, dangerous type, and it was suggested that he be interned. Uh, in fact, uh, what happened was he was instead employed. By the end of 1946, unbeknownst to the public, the U.S. government has two major programs staffed by former Nazis. Under Project Paperclip, former Nazi scientists are being sent to work at various U.S. military bases. Next. At the same time, in Eastern Europe, former General Reinhard Galen's organization is collecting fresh intelligence on the Soviet Union. His organization now employs hundreds of agents, many of them former Nazis. It survives on about half a million dollars a year in Pentagon funding. Galen operates with little oversight. The U.S. Army monitored this organization with two people. That's it. Like Project Paperclip, Galen's spy network has war criminals on its payroll. Well, what he promised not to do was to bring in war criminals. However, the cogs in the wheels of the Holocaust started to turn up in the Galen organization. The U.S. Army isn't eager to challenge its best source for Soviet intelligence on his hiring practices. The U.S. Army asked him, are you hiring war criminals? And he said, no. So it was a marriage of convenience. And a marriage, by the way, an arrangement that suited Galen perfectly. Among Galen's hires, no one is more notorious or reviled by Holocaust survivors than Klaus Barbie. He is a former captain in the Gestapo, who was also known as the Butcher of Lyon. Michel Thomas, a fighter in the French Resistance, was well aware of Barbie's tactics during the war. In one instance, Thomas learned of Barbie's orders for a group of Jewish children in an orphanage near Lyon. And Barbie, of course, had raided the home, arrested and took all the children and, and, and their help, and they were all deported by Barbie to Auschwitz to death. Typical, typical. When the war ends, Barbie reinvents himself as an expert on Soviet intelligence. After a brief stint in the Galen organization, he is recruited by the U.S. Army's counterintelligence division, known as the CIC. The Butcher of Lyon works in relative obscurity until the late 1940s, when French authorities call for his extradition from Germany. When this became enough of a political uh, crisis or political issue in France, American CIC decided to smuggle Barbie out of Europe to get rid of him, to hide him. With the aid of American officials, Barbie is smuggled to Bolivia, where he lives comfortably for the next 30 years. These former Nazis would seem to be valuable intelligence assets in the Cold War. But documents declassified by the U.S. in the late 1990s cast doubt on the accuracy of the information reported by Galen and his spy network. They had to exaggerate the onerous nature of Stalin's regime in, in, in Russia. I mean, why not you just say the fact? It's bad enough. But, and so what they did, they, they pumped up reports claiming that Stalin was mobilizing forces, Soviet military forces in, in eastern Germany that they were going to lurch across the boundary and, and attack Western Europe at any time. Why? Because if the Soviets weren't about to attack, then what do you need Galen for? American officials often fail to properly question Galen's intelligence. Well, there were a series of alarms 
that Galen raised in the fall of 1947 and in early 1948. Some of them were truthful, some of them were not. The truthful uh, alarm was that uh, there was quite a bit of tension in Czechoslovakia at that time. In 1948, despite Stalin's promises to the contrary, the Soviets overthrow Czechoslovakia's elected government and install a communist regime. As Washington watches the coup with alarm, Galen adds even more fuel to the fire. What Galen added to the Czech crisis was a claim that the Soviet troops in the eastern zone were not under-equipped, overextended troops. That they were instead supposedly fresh troops, fully equipped, and positioned for a blitzkrieg type offensive on the west. General Lucius Clay, the US commander in Germany, receives Galen's intelligence. When Clay started to put two and two together with seeing the political crisis in Czechoslovakia, along with these military claims as to what the Soviets were supposedly up to, General Clay sent his suspicions or concerns back to the United States in a famous telegram that spring. And that telegram was to advance a claim that, that war with the Soviets was imminent. But author Christopher Simpson says declassified documents reveal that the threat was overblown. Well, we know in retrospect, in part from the Army's own intelligence, that the claim that they were about to attack was false and was not supported by evidence that was in hand. The intelligence may have been bad, but it serves Galen's immediate need, which is to keep U.S. intelligence focused on the Soviet menace. By the late 1940s, former German general Reinhard Galen is enjoying nearly unquestioned influence as a spy for the U.S., with only minimal supervision from the Army. All that is about to change. The CIA felt that if we didn't control them, someone else might. And it was absolutely necessary to uh, corral, contain, and somehow penetrate this Frankenstein's monster. Since the end of the war, former German general Reinhard Galen has been developing his spy network in West Germany under the U.S. Army. Now the newly created Central Intelligence Agency is poised to take over Galen's organization. Meanwhile, the U.S. government has kept the public from knowing the extent to which former Nazis are involved in American intelligence operations. I call it the CIA's original sin that they would actually incorporate this Nazi-infested spy apparatus into the bosom of U.S. intelligence. And this is all done behind the back of the U.S. public. In fact, the CIA's own analysts are now well aware that Galen has been recruiting war criminals under the less than watchful eye of the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army wanted tactical information about movements of the Soviet armed forces in occupied Germany. As long as the Galen organization continued to provide information on that, the U.S. Army looked the other way on big questions of recruitment. CIA officials realized they must begin to assert greater control over Galen. In spring of 1948, they assign a young, decorated army colonel to investigate Galen's sprawling organization. So in the CIA sends James Critchfield to investigate Galen, to meet with him, Critchfield. Comes back and he says, the CIA should acquire responsibility for the Galen organization. During an interview with the BBC in 1992, the former colonel explained why he told the CIA that it was still going to need Galen and his vast spy network. The reason that I recommended in my original report in December 1948 that we accept responsibility for this organization was that we really had no choice. We had no specialist who had dealt with Soviet forces. But the CIA also recognizes the danger that Galen poses. 
When the CIA looked at this organization, it realized that it had grown so big that it now represented a threat to democracy in West Germany. We don't have a choice. It exists. We can either work with it, control it, penetrate it, use it, or it'll work against us. And once again, growing Soviet aggressions helped to improve Galen's position with U.S. officials. In June 1948, Stalin imposes a blockade on West Berlin, attempting to starve the city and force it to submit to communist control. U.S. warplanes deliver food and medical supplies to the city. And nearly a year later, Stalin finally backs down. The Berlin crisis sparks widespread fear in the West that war with the Soviets is imminent. It is in this atmosphere that the CIA elects to maintain Galen's organization. Colonel Critchfield demands greater control over Galen's recruiting practices, but he soon learns that the former Third Reich general has his own agenda. Galen says, fine, I'll give you what you want. As soon as it's clear that the CIA is going to pick up the tab for Galen, the trap shuts and he says to the Americans, I'm sorry, you misunderstood me. I can't give you the names of the people I'm hiring. That would be against German prestige. Galen also chides his American supervisors, reminding them of how little they know about running a European intelligence operation. You're so naive, you Americans. We Europeans have been spying for centuries. You have to have confidence that I understand how to run an intelligence organization. Ultimately, the CIA's attempts to control Galen prove no more successful than the Army's. By 1949, in response to Stalin's aggressions in Eastern Europe, the U.S. and 11 European countries, which will later include West Germany, form the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO. Any attack on a member nation will be considered an attack on the entire alliance. And because Galen's network is a main conduit of intelligence flowing from east to west, it becomes a prime target for Soviet spies looking to infiltrate the NATO alliance. It was harder for the Soviets after World War II to penetrate directly the United States government, but it could penetrate the Galen organization and acquire NATO secrets. One method by which Soviets gain access to the Galen organization's secrets is to blackmail the same Nazi war criminals hired by Galen, forcing them to work for the Soviets. They used what they knew about the backgrounds of people in the Galen organization against those people. They basically said, listen, we know what you did in World War II, and if you don't work for us, we will expose you. As a result, many of Galen's operatives become double agents spying on the U.S. and NATO for the Soviets. The worst among these is Heinz Felfa, whose treachery blew the covers of hundreds of spies. Heinz Felfa had been in the SS during World War II. He worked his way up the Galen organization and ultimately became chief of Galen's operations against Soviet intelligence, and he was a Soviet mole. What this means is that every Galen operation in the Soviet zone was penetrated and compromised to the Soviet Union by Felfa. As declassified documents now reveal, since 1949, the CIA had been spying on Galen's organization. A number of intelligence professionals in the CIA never wanted to work with Galen. And they continue to make the argument that Galen is a mistake. Even though the CIA is well aware of the dangers posed by Heinz Felfa, it does nothing to prevent counter-espionage within Galen's organization. The blame for this, according to author Timothy Naftali, lies squarely with two parties. It should be laid on Galen and laid on the CIA for basically um, mishandling Galen and not putting, putting screws to him. In fact, it isn't until 1961 
that CIA agents arrest Heinz Felfa as a KGB agent. Through the early 1950s, the CIA continues to investigate additional reports of Soviet penetration of Galen's organization. Nonetheless, even Galen's harshest critics acknowledge that he was hugely successful in one key respect. Through his efforts, the new government of West Germany was able to build its own intelligence apparatus. In 1956, Galen's organization officially becomes West Germany's intelligence operation, known as the BND. Some say that, as a loyal German, Galen had been working toward this goal from the very start. He had achieved what he wanted to achieve overall. He had become a very significant figure in, in German history. So that I think, uh, I think in the end, Galen was the winner. But the true cost of employing Galen's organization and using former Nazi scientists will not be revealed for another four decades. By the 1970s, some Americans are beginning to ask questions about the presence of ex-Nazis in their midst. As an American, what are these people doing on our shores? How many Americans went to fight in World War II? All of a sudden, to have their sacrifice made a mockery of by having Hitler's henchmen come here and be given security and the benefits of liberty. Spring 1974, New York Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman learns of the nearly 30-year history of former Nazis brought to the U.S. to work on defense projects. Somebody who was very knowledgeable about immigration matters came to see me. He came and told me the story that the U.S. government had a list of Nazi war criminals living in the United States and was doing nothing about it. And my first reaction was, this is crazy. I can't believe it. She immediately contacts Immigration and Naturalization Service Commissioner Leonard Chapman. I said to the Immigration Commissioner, is it true that you have a list of Nazi war criminals in the United States? And his answer was yes. And I almost fell off my chair because I didn't expect it to be true. Holtzman launches a campaign to change American immigration law. In 1978, Congress passes the Holtzman Amendment. It denies Nazi war criminals admission to the United States and mandates the deportation of those who have already been admitted. That same year, the Office of Special Investigations, or OSI, is created in the U.S. Justice Department. One goal of the OSI is to find the evidence about Nazi war criminals living in America and to bring them to justice. In 1980, 25 year old attorney Eli Rosenbaum no. joins the OSI. No. If you've got the evidence, we'll do it. His first major case is that of Arthur Rudolph, the former Nazi engineer who was brought to the U.S. back in the 1940s under Project Paperclip. In the United States, Arthur Rudolph had gained uh, near heroic status. Uh, he was, after all, one of the key uh, NASA officials uh, responsible for building uh, the Saturn V, the rocket that took humankind to the moon in 1969. Rosenbaum is convinced that Rudolph has blood on his hands. Decades before, Rudolph exploited Dora concentration camp inmates in his effort to perfect Germany's V-2 rocket used on Allied targets throughout Europe. The utilization of slave labor is a violation of the Nuremberg Charter. It's a crime against humanity. He should have been prosecuted uh, criminally right after the war for what he did, but he wasn't. The two men meet on February 4th, 1983. In a tape-recorded interview, Rosenbaum attempts to get Rudolph to admit his guilt. The following are audio excerpts from that interview. But did it, didn't it occur to you that they might send you more prisoners, might send prisoners? I could have been prisoners, yes. He brought these people 
down to this hellhole, knowing exactly what gruesome conditions uh, they were going to be exposed to. And he did it without any concern uh, for, their, for their lives or their health. You must have thought of who was going to build these rockets. I mean, they were going to be working for you, a lot of them. Yes, uh, but uh, the uh, situation was so confused at that time. At the Middleburg, prisoners uh, who were involved in production had different kinds of little badges, little stone cloth to indicate what kind of prisoners they were, for instance, probably, political. I don't recall what probably. You sure you don't recall uh, like a yellow, like a yellow star of David? No. You don't recall no. that? Despite Rudolph's denials, Rosenbaum and the OSI believe they have enough evidence to prosecute the former Nazi. The OSI was going to bring a case against him, and Rudolph left the country rather than face certain deportation because of the uh, war crimes that he engaged in. The OSI stays on the hunt for other Nazi war criminals living in America. But the full story of the use of former Nazis by U.S. intelligence during the Cold War will remain classified for another 20 years. The former Soviet Union had opened up their files, yet the American government, the country of openness, of a democracy, was still veiling it in total secrecy. In the mid-1980s, New questions emerge about the use of former Nazis in American scientific and intelligence operations. Beginning in 1984, author Mary Ellen Reese spends six years researching Reinhard Galen and his ties to the CIA. One very, very senior CIA officer said to me, we have papers that say things about Galen that we don't want on the record. We don't want the people to see that. Over the next decade, even with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the CIA remains unwilling to open its files. In 1998, Congress passes the Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act, sponsored by New York Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. The bill requires the CIA to reveal details about its relationship with former Third Reich officers, including Reinhard Galen. They insisted on having uh, an item that said that anything that pertained to current national security could not be disclosed. But this was 50, 60 years after World War II. On October 8, 1998, the act is signed into law by President Bill Clinton. Over the next six years, eight million documents from the CIA, U.S. Army, and other government organizations are made public the largest declassification of U.S. intelligence records in history. Cold War expert Timothy Naftali reviews the documents concerning the Galen organization and is shocked by what he discovers. When the CIA finally analyzed his operations, they discovered that 90% of them were garbage. They were either fraudulent they didn't exist, or the information that was being provided was worthless. Naftali and others believe this faulty intelligence was detrimental to the U.S. The United States paid a very serious price for relying on Galen for intelligence. Uh, part of the price was protecting Nazi war criminals. Part of the price was not fulfilling our treaty obligation to prosecute war criminals, which we have a legal treaty obligation to do. Two-thirds of the raw intelligence that filtered into NATO came through the Galen network. So they played a very important role during uh, the, the Cold War, and I fear also a very negative role in terms of influencing U.S.-Soviet relations in a way that wasn't helpful to either country, but was ultimately helpful to Galen and his Nazis. Critics also question whether engineers like former Nazi Arthur Rudolph made a real contribution to American scientific progress. Arthur Rudolph was a competent administrator of large scientific enterprises. He was a CEO type, if you will. He had management skills. Uh, the claim that the United States needed Rudolph 
uh, is, uh, I personally, I see no evidence that supports that. French resistance fighter and concentration camp survivor Michel Thomas was recruited in March of 1945 by U.S. Army intelligence. He was present with Allied troops at the liberation of the Dachau concentration camp on April 29, 1945. We never, and they say we never should have uh, even considered or thought of it, thought of, of working with Nazi, with uh, Gestapo. It, it was part of uh, our mission to arrest them and to, and, uh, and to see if ever justice done. I don't know if there is any human justice to all the inhuman activities. No matter where they go or what they do, they always try to remember what to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb, duck and cover. But for many former Cold Warriors who operated under the very real threat of war with the Soviets, the decision was between the lesser of two evils. In 1946, Robert Livingston was a member of the U.S. Army's Intelligence Corps, the CIC. Stationed in Austria, his unit collected general intel on Soviet activity. It is a duplicitous double game, uh, and you have to work with people uh, who you not, would not go to dinner with, whose morals are sometimes uh, uh, not only dubious, maybe even in the gutter, you know, uh, and you have to do that sometimes to advance a, uh, a higher cause. The champion of the relationship between the CIA and Galen, James Critchfield, defended the collaboration with the former Third Reich general until his death in 2003. All of this was real life and death intelligence during this period. And I think it's, it's for that reason that there was no questioning by anyone of uh, the value of it at that moment in history. Critchfield reminded critics that Galen's organization built an intelligence apparatus for West Germany that served the Western Alliance throughout the Cold War. Christopher Simpson acknowledges this, but still disputes the wisdom of working with Galen. A lot of people argue that collaboration with the Nazis was not necessarily a bad thing that supposedly the United States gained in terms of intelligence information, that supposedly they gained some sort of advantage in terms of dealing with Eastern Europe and Soviets and so on. I think that's simply untrue. The fundamental cost of deciding to work with people who've committed genocide and crimes against humanity is by itself corrupt. The very institutions that we employ to gather intelligence can also poison or mislead intelligence. So that you have a situation in which a government is simultaneously heavily dependent upon intelligence and yet cannot count upon the intelligence to be actually accurate. But in times of war, the need for intelligence can often trump ethical concerns. We're faced with that same problem in Iraq today. I mean, who do we work with? Do we work with uh, those who are pristine clean? There are very few that are pristine clean. And of course, judgments in hindsight are always a lot easier than they are at the time. And you're faced with a concrete problem. You're an operating officer of an intelligence outfit. Your boss say, we need information on X, Y, and Z. So these are the type of compromises that have to be made in, uh, in uh, the big political game sometimes. Meanwhile, more documents are still being declassified under the Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act. But the full story of Reinhard Galen's relationship with U.S. intelligence may never be known. Do I think we got all of it? No. I didn't get a chance to walk the halls of the CIA archive. None of us did. I think the most important thing to say is that we are not going to give up without getting the truth. The agencies that still have not given us the information that we need, I think they will have to. The preceding program presented theories about an historical event that is shrouded in mystery. It contained archival footage, reenactments, and dramatizations, which invite you, the viewer, to draw your own conclusions.